So in this topic today, we're going to talk about building optimized Java microservices with Micronaut, and more specifically, we'll also go over Micronaut 4, which is coming out uh, very shortly. So uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Micronaut, Micronaut is a relatively new, it's been around for a little while now, but it's a relatively new framework for Java, for the Java ecosystem, that works very differently to your traditional application frameworks. It's, it's, hence the name, it's focused on microservices and serverless workloads, but really it's a general purpose framework, so you can use it for any kind of application. We have folks who are using Micronaut in the context of building uh, command line applications, building serverless applications, building IoT applications deployed to devices. Um, so it's very, very flexible. <clears throat> and the way it works is by plugging into the Java compiler or if you're using Kotlin, the Kotlin compiler, or if you're using Groovy, the Groovy compiler. And it computes everything to do with the way the framework works during the compilation phase of the application. So whilst your application is compiling, it'll analyze your application, uh, your source code, uh, it's essentially an annotation processor, and generate classes um, that sit alongside your existing classes that essentially enhance the performance and startup of your application, reducing its memory footprint and so forth. Uh, this, th in this way, it shifts a lot of the processing from runtime to the compilation step. And that results in a much smaller, thinner, lighter runtime uh, than your traditional frameworks like Spring and so forth. Uh, that, that optimization is, makes it smaller, both in terms of the, the actual packaging and deployment size, so whether you're, when you're building a jar file or a Docker image, it, it's smaller, uh, but also in terms of then all the runtime footprint, because we're doing so much at compilation time that it's able to eliminate code that's no longer necessary at runtime, like compute, computing reflective caches and that, and that kind of thing. Because essentially, Micronaut doesn't use reflection. It doesn't use the traditional technologies that Frameworks, traditional frameworks used like runtime reflection, uh, runtime bytecode generation, dynamic class loading, all of that is eliminated from the runtime part, which actually has a number of other benefits. It has benefits like, for example, in terms of security. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's no, since there's no reflection at runtime, the, the, and that no reflective, you can still do reflection in your own code, of course, I want to make that clear, but at the framework level, there's none. Um, that leaves us, you know, a smaller vulnerability footprint. Um, and if you took a look at things like Micronaut serialization, which is our uh, serialization and deserialization library for JSON and other formats, which can be seen as a complete replacement for Jackson, that also al allows you to restrict uh, what is serializable and what is deserializable, reducing again the potential for vulnerabilities. So it, it has a, by default, it has a client and a server based on the Neti IO toolkit, but it's also pluggable. Like I said, it's very modular. Um, the server implementation is by default Neti, but we have server implementations that are based on Tomcat. We have server implement, we have implementations that are not even, don't even have a server, serverless, right? So based on AWS Lambda or, or Oracle function or whatever, right? So. We have a, a very also rich ecosystem of um, modules covering a wide range of use cases, um, particularly for cloud deployments. So we have modules that are for uh, help you to deploy your application to whichever cloud, whether it be AWS, Azure, a GCP, Oracle Cloud, and um, a very uh, you know growing and and rich ecosystem out there for building applications. Now, you've probably heard of GraalVM, um, or some of you may have heard of GraalVM. So uh, I, I work for Oracle Labs, and GraalVM is one of the, another technology that's part of our portfolio, uh, and it's a key part uh, that takes that next step where Micronaut pro uh, optimizes the Java compilation side. GraalVM is able to take your, your Java application and turn it into a self-contained native executable or a native image, uh, which has a number of additional benefits that allow you to take Java workloads to places that just weren't possible before. So with GraalVM, you can produce a native executable that runs specifically on the platform that it's designed for, whether it be Linux, Mac, uh, Windows, 
And that, that executable starts significantly faster, reduces memory even further, and, um, and, and, and re rarely um, provides optimizations, particularly for certain kinds of workloads. So GraalVM, like for example for serverless, has really enabled Java to be used in a serverless context where that just wasn't, you know, whilst it was technically possible, it wasn't optimal. Now with GraalVM, it's actually optimal as well. Uh, and it it's also it allows you to do go to take Java to places that weren't technically possible before. I mentioned IoT devices. We have people using Micronaut plus GraalVM to run on tiny devices that run on edge services that were just not possible to deploy to with Java, raw Java before because of the memory footprint requirements of the device, whether it be a Raspberry Pi or something smaller, right? So uh, between Micronaut and GraalVM, there's really been a revolution in the last few years in terms of optimizing Java for these kinds of workloads, for different kinds of workloads. Uh, I know a lot of you folks possibly are building more traditional applications, traditional workloads, but there's, you know, the variety of deployments out there need more flexible and innovative solutions. And in the Java space, Micronaut and GraalVM have been optimizing these workloads and providing possibilities that are really exciting and for Java developers to open up new possibilities. In addition to that, recently at Oracle, we announced uh, Graal Cloud Native, which is a curated and a collaborative effort where we work uh, at Oracle. We have around 15 people working on the Micronaut framework through the Micronaut Foundation. And uh, through that contribution, we also want to make available a curated set of modules that are known to work with native image and we, we can support officially um, through or on when, when deploying to Oracle Cloud. So check out those links if you want to form, find more, more about Graal Cloud Native. It's an important initiative for us. Now let's move on to Micronaut 4. So Micronaut's history in terms of um, uh, releases, you know, about two years ago released Micronaut 3. Uh, now we're on to the next major release. And I was hoping to be able to come to you and talk to you about this new Micronaut 4 release as it already being released. Um, we, our initial plan was the second quarter of um, uh, 2023. Unfortunately, that hasn't quite happened. We're, we're hoping to release next week. Uh, and all the demos I'm going to be doing today are with Micronaut 4, so it's actually ready to adopt now. But we're actually going GA next week. And it provides a number of significant advancements uh, to the framework. So for example, uh, this release will officially support GraalVM 23, which just came out as well. And we'll also use JDK 17 or Java 17 as a baseline. So if, you, if you're still deploying to using Java 8, uh, then you want to stick with Micronaut 3, and we're going to continue to support that, that release. But if you want the latest and greatest features for the latest and greatest version of Java LTS, then you want to go ahead and look at Micronaut 4. Speaking of latest and greatest, with uh, Micronaut 4, we have initial support for virtual threads. Uh, which means, or Loom, which requires JDK 20 plus at the moment, but as soon as JDK 21 is out, it will be out of preview and uh, we'll support them officially. Now, uh, virtual threads are an exciting new feature because it al potentially allows uh, you, know, you to write traditional imperative logic and get the same kind of scalability benefits offered by reactive programming, right? So I'd, you might have heard me mention that the Micronaut 4 server is based on Netty, uh, so that's that's essentially a event loop non-blocking I/O based server toolkit. And what we have with uh, virtual thread support in Micronaut 4 is the ability to offload to uh, virtual threads from the Netty uh, event loop, and allow you to scale out even further and write traditional blocking apps, traditional imperative code, um, uh, and scale those out on virtual threads, which is really exciting. For Micronaut 4, it's even more modular than before as well. We have been breaking down the framework into more reusable components, and certain parts of the framework can now be separated and, uh, and not included if you so choose. For example, Micronaut th things like Micronaut Retry, um, Micronaut Discovery, Micronaut uh, Validation can be excluded. Those were previously packaged, so if you really want to get like the smallest possible footprint of your application, you can do that. 
And well, the, the feature that I'm particularly excited about is we, in Microsoft 4, uh, given my history in, within the Spring community and so forth, is the expression language support. So we have a new expression language for Micronaut 4, and it's very cool because basically it's completely compilation time-based and reflection-free and type-checked. So as you type an expression and compile your code, if you, if you make an ex a mistake in your expression in the annotation, it will fail compilation and say this is an invalid expression, and it will compile the expression into a completely reflection-free invocation. So you can define things like Micronaut security rules using expressions or conditional job schedules or all sorts of things throughout the framework, and at compilation time, they are checked, validated. And this is also far, far more secure. You know, there's been several instances, there's been a few incidences of, of vulnerabilities uh, in expression languages out there. Micronauts expression language does not allow runtime evaluation of expressions. It's fully compile time based fully uh, type checked and, f and absolutely safe. We would not have put this in the framework if it wasn't you know, absolutely secure. So, um, so this is really exciting. And beyond that, we also have uh, the shift from JavaX to Jakarta. So we finally made the transition <coughs> to use the new namespace for all the different APIs that Micronaut exposes. And for our Kotlin user base, which is significant, last we were looking at, we, we kind of track uh, who's using Micronaut and how, how many users we have in Kotlin was about 30%. So uh, we have support for Kotlin symbol processing, which is a new uh, compilation time API, uh, compiler plugin API for KSP that's significant, uh, for Kotlin that is significantly faster. Um, we also have support for annotation driven HTTP filters. And this, is, this was kind of uh, our previous HTTP filter-based API was based on reactive streams. And now, uh, as we move to a virtual thread world, we've been op optimizing the entire HTTP stack, stack to plan for uh, the future where there is no reactive code at all in, in the entire end-to-end -end pipeline. So you can write filters, and if, the, if no reactive code is, uh, is required to execute them, it'll go the fast path of running it on the uh, virtual thread uh, event loop and allow the blocking code to proceed. So we're, we're planning ahead in terms of virtual thread support. We also have experimental support for new techno new, newer technologies like HTTP3, IO, Euring. And in addition, uh, from at the compiler level, we've allowed annotations on generic type arguments, which is really nice because uh, now, we, now you, for example, you can de declare uh, validation annotations on the generic type arguments, so you can have list, not blank string kind of thing, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, and we've, we've, we've improved modularity, like I said, and added lots of quality of life improvements, better error message, injection of maps, and overall the framework is just better. So let's do some demoing now. That's enough, to that's enough talk. Let's get over to writing some code and seeing how uh, ex uh, how, how, how what Micronaut 4 looks like, and to be honest, it doesn't look hugely different from Micronaut 3. So we haven't <laughs> we haven't uh, you know changed the developer experience, but what we have is um, a much more optimal one, and you will see. Well, I'll demo some of the expression stuff. So here I have a Micronaut uh, application. It's like any other traditional Java application. We have a source main uh, source main Java directory where, where my code is and we have an application class that lets me launch the application. Micronaut includes a testing framework that lets you uh, declare integration tests, and this is very uh, nice because it, it automatically lets you dependency inject components into the test <coughs> using at inject, or you can even pass them as arguments. Now, this application that I've set up to demonstrate is, is already set up with a few uh, features. If you wanted to replicate this application, it's using things like Micronaut Data, Micronaut Data JDBC, a MySQL database, and so forth. Um, and you can go to um, start.micronaut.io um, to create this application, or in your IDE, in IntelliJ Ultimate, and in um, VS Code, there are wizards that, that work with Micronaut Launch where you can create your application. But basically, I chose Micronaut 4, um, and, I cho and I chose some specific features like 
Micronaut Data, JDBC, and so forth. And, and you can click, once you've decided on your application, you can click Generate Project, import it into your IDE, and you're ready to go. So um, one of the really nice features that we introduced late on in Micronaut 3, but we've barely been optimizing for Micronaut 4, is our integration with test resources or test containers. Um, so this application, for example, includes integration with MySQL. Now, if I run this, uh, it includes a configuration for a MySQL database, which you can see it's using MySQL. Um, and if I run this, uh, this test, what's going to happen is it's going to start the test, and it's actually going to start a test container that's going to start my database. And it's going to run the test against a real MySQL database, right? Now, one of the important things with, as a developer that you want is your test to execute quick, quickly and fast. Um, so as you can see, that particular execution took 16 seconds to start the MySQL container and then run my, my test against the database. Uh, 16 seconds is not great. It's quite a long time because I'm waiting for like, the MySQL container to start up. Um, so one of the things we recommend you do with Micronaut whenever you get going is to do um, and we have both Gradle. First of all, I want to point out we have both Gradle and Maven integration. I'm demonstrating Gradle, but if you do Maven W M N run, it's the same. And if I do Gradle W run slash T, that activates what's called uh, continuous mode um, <coughs> with my Micronode application. So every time I make a change to my Micronode application, it's going to automatically restart the server. And, and you're going to see, uh, and it's going to be instant, almost instantaneous, it will start up. You can see the first startup took 13 seconds because it had to start the MySQL <laughs> instance and connect up to the database. But now the cool thing is, now that I have continuous mode running in the background, I can come back to my test here, and I can run this test. Um, I can run this test from my IDE, and it connects to the existing running application in the existing container, um, and it, it runs, in, you know, Almost instantly, right? Uh, I'm not waiting for the for the MySQL. See, pretty much instantly, right? So I can have my MySQL container managed by Micronaut in the background, and I can run my integration tests. And you can write integration tests that use real databases instead of having mock unit test, mock this, mock this. You can have all those containers managed and run the, run those tests instantly, and get the same productivity that you get when writing unit tests. Gone are the days of having to separate, separate out unit tests, introduce mocking, et cetera. You can actually write, write uh, production level uh, integration tests that are super fast to execute. And that's one of the cool things about Micronaut. Um, uh, so the, since this is a database application, let's dem demonstrate some more things that you can do. So one of the features in Micronaut is uh, Micronaut data. And Micronaut Data lets you write, um, lets you use an underlying technology, for example, JPA, Java Persistence API, or JDBC directly to write repositories. So if you've ever used Spring Data, <coughs> I was involved in the very early development of Spring Data, defining the original APIs the way Spring Data worked. And the history of Spring Data is that it came from Grails where we had the technology called GORM, which let you write like dynamic finders and so forth. Um, the next evolution of that was Spring Data, which we built uh, back in 2011, I think. And when we started Micronaut, I really wanted to take database access productivity to the next level, and that's Micronaut Data. <clears throat> and how is it different to Spring Data? So it, it, instead of checking your repository definitions at runtime, it does all the checking at compilation time. And this is a, this is a theme with Micronaut that you will see when, when, whenever you're using it. So, for example, let's, let's go and build a theoretical um, uh, pet clinic style application. So I'm going to define a pet rec record. Now, this is another cool thing about <coughs> Micronaut uh, data. JDBC is that you can use records. So I can make this a mapped entity that maps to the database, and it's got a long uh, ID, and this is going to be a generated value that is the ID of the entity, right? And we, my pet is going to have a name, um, oops, and it's going to have an age, 
and maybe we're going to have a health rating rating for the, you know, for how more or less rating one out of ten or nine being you're super healthy, one being you're not very healthy. So we got all these fields that represent different aspects of data. This is as a mapped entity. This is going to be mapped to a pet table. Um, if I wanted to customize that, I could say under Skype T pet or whatever. Uh, so that's my pet record. And uh, what you can do is you can define repositories. So I can say I'm going to create a pet repository. And this is going to be a JDBC repository that's using a dialect of MySQL. And we're going to extend a CRUD repository. And we're going to supply the entity type and the ID type. So with that, I have a uh, repository implementation. Now what I can do is I can go to my, for example, application class, and I'm going to make this application class a singleton. So what does that mean? I mean, yeah, I could do this with any class. Just <coughs> make, making it a singleton makes it a component of my application that's subject to dependency injection. Right? So I'm just making my application class a singleton. And then I'm going to inject into my uh, application class my pet repository, like so. There it is. And I'm going to use it right, uh, to write an event listener that is using, uh, that runs when the application start, starts up. So we, uh, Micronaut has a whole uh, event system that you can use and a whole bunch of built-in events. One of them is startup event. Startup event is fired, as the name might suggest, when the application starts up, right? Um, and I'm going to make this transactional. So Micronaut has built-in support for jakarta.transaction, so I can run this method within the scope of a transaction. If anything goes wrong, we can roll, roll it back automatically or commit it automatically. And in here, I'm going to say pet repository dot save all, and I'm going to list, gonna, and I'm going to save a couple of pets. So we're going to do one, let's call one pet. First ID is the, is the ID, so initially there's not going to be an ID, so I just supply null. Let's call him Fred. Maybe he has 10, and he has a health rating of 7 or something. Um, and then I'm going to save another pet. Um, like that, right? And let's call this one Bob, and maybe this Bob is a bit younger, so a bit healthier, maybe, I don't know. Um, and there we go, so we have, we have two pets <coughs> saved to my database. We can verify that this r runs on, on startup by writing some integration tests, so I actually like dependency injecting by uh, with Micronaut by uh, their arguments instead. So you can actually direct directly inject to the JUnit5 test arguments right there. And then you can do assert equals to repository.count and replace that with a static import. And if we run this, theoretically, um, it should work and my application will, my test will pass, which it does, right? So I've written some initial database access logic there using Micronaut Data JDBC. Now, the cool thing with Micronaut is the way it's end-to-end -end integrated with, with everything. So uh, I can, for example, directly on this entity, I can define uh, validation rules, like that's not blank, and the age must be a positive number, and the health rating must be a minimum one and a maximum ten, and we and we get like validation rule rules built in. Now, one of the changes in Micronaut four that I I, I I mentioned was support for annotations on generic type arguments. Um, so previously, Micronaut. Uh, would validate automatically anything, anything that you pass to the repository. In Micronaut 4, we actually changed this because uh, so that users who don't want validation can remove it and add it. So now the way you do it is you can say, this should be valid. And that's much nicer because you have more fine-grained control, right? 
by the generic type argument that this, this particular pet should be valid for any method that defines in the repository. Yeah? Or, or, or the long, you can say this must be a positive number or whatever. Um, so generic annotations on generic type arguments is, 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 re is really nice. Now, um, uh, database access logic is, is, is super easy to implement. And so is repository, like uh, controller logic. For example, I can define a pet controller here um, that is mapped to a particular end URI. Let's call it pet. And um, I can uh, inject my uh, pet repository into the constructor. You'll notice that whenever I, I, I tend to favor constructor injection, um, it works really nicely. You just define a construct argument, and it more like clearly expresses the requirements of the class. You know, I know if people, some people historically have, you know, done this kind of thing, where you say inject, but I think it leads to confusion about what what is actually for the needed for the class to function, and more likelihood of a null pointer exception during your tests, and it's more. So definitely favor constructor injection, and here you can write endpoints. Uh, really easily. So, for example, um, if I wanted to list all of the pet names, um, list names, for example, I could maybe write a uh, names endpoint, right? And I could say, if I like re return uh, this dot pet repository dot find um, name. Now, this is an interesting thing here, is that that the um, find name method doesn't exist, but I can create it in the pet repository, and it will be automatically aware that the pet entity has a name property, and therefore will perform a project projection just to retrieve the names, right? Um, and so that, that's really cool how you can do projections on just to retrieve like particular properties. Now, what's interesting, in, is that if I were to rename this to find nom, which is clearly something that, that doesn't exist, right? Um, you'll see that that will actually fail with a compilation error in my continuous build thing happening, or if I'd run my test, it would have failed as well. And this is where Micronaut data is really powerful, right? Because it's checking, actively checking a compilation time. Am I doing the right thing with the framework, right? In another framework, or not, other framework, you would get a runtime error saying, you know, something went wrong here, uh, and it's this is not ideal. You know, go and fix it and run again. Here, you're getting like active compilation time um, checking of what is possible to do with the framework. Right? I can correct that, and and um, it will eventually, hopefully, recompile. Yeah, and start up. So, um, so with that, you know, we, we have like a basic endpoint um, that we can we can hit. Hopefully, uh, oh, it's pets names, I guess. There we go. So it's retrieving the data from my my application uh, and and all as well. So Micronaut data is is a really really cool cool thing, and you know there's a lot of flexibility that you get with different queries. For example, I can define uh, another query that lists all the pets, and maybe find by you, you get completion in the ID in both IntelliJ Ultimate and VS Code. So you can say find by health rating greater than you know I don't know five or something. And, you, and, and it will implement all that logic for you, and you get you get active compilation time checking of what's what's happening, right? Which which is really 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 sweet. Now, Micronaut itself has like so many different uh, features built in that make it easier to create resilient applications as well. Uh, so when I created this application, for example, um, I uh, I basically included the management endpoint, so. I have built-in support for things like health checking for my health data, and I can run those management endpoints on a different port if I wanted to, so I can change the management port. I have 
integration with metrics so I can get, uh, oh, I think I don't think I've selected the metrics feature when I can. But anyway, if I, select, if I had selected Macrometer, it would be there, right? So you just have to select Macrometer metrics and you'll select them, you know, see the metrics endpoint and the data and so forth. So all of those features help you create production ready applications that are ready to, de to deploy. And in addition to that, you know, you can create uh, highly resilient applications. For example, if I were to go to my test, and, and I, I could actually write a test here that tested my endpoint, right? Um, and I could define an interface here, let's call it pet client, that's gonna actually talk to my pet's endpoint. And uh, it's going to basically call that name's endpoint, for example. Um, uh, what I can do is I can inject this client, and this is going to be a full integration test. This is with Micronaut's declarative HTTP client. And I can call pet client names to get all the names back, right? And I can say this is uh, so equals to names.size. And this is like a full uh, integration test that's using an HTTP client to send um, a send a request to the HTTP server, and if I run it, it should work in theory. And it works, right? So this is an HTTP client request going to my server end-to-end, -end, and it runs, executes instantaneously. Now, if this was a real HTTP client, I could, I could define this with an ID, say pets, and I could configure that ID to point to my service wherever, it, and Micronaut features extensive support for service discovery with Kubernetes, with console, with Eureka, with uh, in the cloud, uh, based on IDs, service IDs, and you can look it up and so forth. In this case, I'm not gonna do that, but you, you've also got re resiliency primitives. So, you know, I can say uh, this, this operation is retriable. So, you know, if, it's, if it fails to retry again, um, I've got circuit breaker uh, support so that you can basically short circuit the circuit and you know come back, try me again later when I'm better, right? So all of those primitives are built into the framework and it makes it highly resilient and easy to, def to define these kinds of applications. Now I mentioned uh, before as well the notion of the expression language that I'm really excited about for Micronaut 4. So, uh, and it's, it's, it's really cool. So one of the things you can do, for example, is define a type safe uh, configuration in Micronauts. So I can um, imagine, for example, I had a scheduled job, a scheduled job that executed, new, executed every few seconds or a few minutes that checked on the health of the different pets in the system, right? And, and maybe sent a notification, hey, somebody's unhealthy, right? Um, so what you can do is you can define, and you can use records as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a configuration property called pets job, right? And uh, I'm going to define like uh, something in here that says, is it paused, right? Is the job paused or not paused? And maybe something like unhealthy threshold where when you get to, you know, there's the fire, you need a certain amount of hunt. Or let's just call it unhealthy so that it's easier to remember. And what we can do is in my configuration, um, we can configure this pet job configuration directly. And the cool thing is you get ID completion automatically. So I can say the job is not paused. So the ID integration, the ID is already aware of that, that configuration properties. And the unhealthy threshold is maybe five, right? So when uh, health of a pet hits five, uh, we, you know. And now what I can do is I can create a job. Um, let's call it pet job. That is a singleton, and let's, let's make it a scheduled job. Well, first let's inject my configuration. So we're gonna inject the pet job configuration. Um, like that. And we're going to create a new construct argument for it, right? And we're going to make this a scheduled job 
um, called report unhealthy, something like that. And for the moment, we're just going to output it to print line. But you know, we could send an email or some operational thing. Pet is unhealthy, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so we're going to run this in a at a fixed rate, uh, just for every, every ten seconds. Now, the cool thing about the uh, the expression language and the possibilities that it opens up is you can do things like add conditions. So I can say, you know, this will only run if configuration not paused, right? So we know it's expression languages because it opens up with hash and curly bracket. I can reference the configuration of my job, check if it's not paused, and only run if it's not paused, right? So the expression language is really, really sweet. Now, now uh, the other cool thing is uh, that um, the, ah, you see, it's already type checking that my expression is correct. So I've actually got a compilation error here saying it can't find anything with configuration that is available because you actually, in the context of expressions, need to refer to this, right? So um, when I save this, hopefully it, Let's see. Um, ah, there's no, I actually need to expose the configuration as a property. So it has to be available as a property of B. So luckily I have this compiler that's helping me to figure these out with good, good error messages, yeah? Giving me all these good error messages and telling me what I'm doing wrong while I'm doing live demos to all the people in the audience, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there you go, pet, pet is unhealthy, right? So. Obviously, I, I pro should probably check the other parts of my configuration, like the threshold and run a query and whatever else, and, and et cetera. But uh, if I go into my configuration uh, and I say this job is paused, right, and my application restarts, it won't actually run the scheduled job, right, because the job is paused. And I can unpause it. I could man add a management endpoint to my application that my, only my management ops people can run to pause and resume the job. or or whatever, right? So very cool uh, uh, capabilities getting added via the expression language in Micronaut 4. And you know, Micronaut is really, really, really flexible. There's lots of possibilities to open, and this is, uh, just opens up even more flexibility uh, to the framework. Uh, one thing I forgot to point out as well with, with, uh, with Micronaut data, and a feature I really love, is the ability to define data transfer objects. So you, you can see that we have a, a pet entity here which has a number of uh, fields, each of them mapping to a column in the database, right? ID, name, age, health rating. But it might be that you, for a particular query, you only want a subset of the data, right? So, and this is where uh, it, come, uh, it comes in really handy, Micronaut data support for DTOs or data transfer objects. So you can define, a, for example, a, a pet DTO that, that only retrieves the name and the age, right? And you can define it uh, in the return type uh, of, so for example, I can write another query here that lists all of the pets, DTOs, right? And, um, uses my DTO. DTO. Now, there's, no, there's a couple of ways, rules here. One is the DTO uses, needs to use at introspective. This is our compile time introspection uh, support. But another thing that's cool as well is with Micronaut serialization. So, you, so by default with Micronaut, if I would try to serialize this DTO, so for example, if I wrote a controller here called uh, endpoint here called that list, listed my DTO and listed everything, right? Um, and used this dot repository dot list and, and basically listed all the records. If I were to hit that uh, in with curl in here, uh, let's hit the pets endpoint, it says internal server error. So 
this is expected because with Micronaut data and Micronaut serialization, you cannot serialize pet DTO without explicitly saying this, this is serializable. There's been lots of vulnerabilities historically with things like Jackson for arbitrary serialization of parts of the object graph that you didn't expect to be serializable. So imagine you have an entity and then you have a field and admin details and then that gets serialized and you didn't realize, right? Um, so you actually have to, with Micronaut serialization, and of course we still support Jackson, so if you prefer Jackson, you can continue using Jackson. We haven't dropped support for Jackson. But you can be, build more secure applications by specifically declaring which parts of your application are serializable and not serializable, right? And there's an annotation called certable. Now that's the kind of both ways, so that means serializable and deserializable, but you can also say this is only serializable and it's not deserializable, right? Or, or vice versa. So you can control, you're in more control of what parts of your application actually get serialized, leaving you less likely and less open to serialization and deserialization vulnerabilities, right? Um, so if I say that, hopefully, uh, that last demo will work, and it does. Now, you can see I'm retrieving the age and the name of each pet, uh, which is cool. But the important thing about the DTO as well, when it combined with Micronaut data, is Micronaut data is actually optimizing the query as well to only select the columns underneath that. So it's optimizing the query. It's not just doing a blind select star, or, and then, you know, it's actually being smart and optimizing the query. And of course, Micronaut data doesn't take anything away from you. You can still come in here and you can write, use the at query annotation to you know, directly write your SQL um, statements and bind them to parameters. And in fact, I think even the IDEs often com offer completion for all of the SQL queries. Nothing is taken away. And I'm, I'm demonstrating Micronaut data JDBC because I really like it because of the record support and it's a much simpler model. But we support JPA. You can use Hibernate if that's what you used to. And it's all, it also works really well. So that was the live coding section of the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And now I'll give you some tips on how you can get started on your own exploring Micronaut and GraalVM. So if you wanted to create your own application, exactly the same as my demo here, you can go to start.micronaut.io start.micronaut.io and choose the features that you want. I don't know what you guys are interested in. The, I demoed here like data with Micronaut Data JDBC. Maybe you prefer JPA, maybe you prefer MongoDB. There's lots of like different integrations and different possibilities. In this demo today, I used IntelliJ Ultimate, but we also have really great tooling for VS Code. <coughs> Uh, so there's VS Code extensions that offer even like finder completion, configuration validation uh, in both IDEs. The documentation for the um, framework is available at docs.micronaut.io. Guides. So we don't have a lot of like um, just kind of sample applications hanging out, out, out there. We Every single guide for Micronaut, and there's dozens of them, is also a sample application. Um, so if you're looking for sample applications on how to use Micronaut, go to guides.micronaut.io because it's awesome. And there's loads and loads of guides from advanced topics like Kubernetes service discovery to beginner's topics like creating your first Micronaut application. Now the cool thing is you can go into these guides, you can choose whether you're a Java or a Kotlin or a Groovy user, whether you prefer Maven, whether you prefer Gradle, choose one of the guides, and there's a comprehensive, this is just like Hello World, right? Uh, basic application, creating your first Micronaut application. You can come in here, the guide. The, now the cool thing about the guides is every release of Micronaut we do is tested, integration tested with the guides, right? So we, we do a release, we bump the version, and they get the guides get updated. So everything is tested. Even all the snippets are tested. We, you know, we, there's a huge amount of testing, and that's why we, we went through a phase where we had like random sample applications on GitHub, and they were not being maintained. And the, the way forward is guides. We have like, and each one, uh, if you look over here, you can download the complete solution by clicking this button as a zip file. So you got the source code, you got the sample application, whatever language you choose, uh, whatever build tool you choose. So the guides for for Micronaut are really great. And for GraalVM, you can learn more about GraalVM at graalvm.org. Uh, 
So, and that brings me to the final part, which is like the deployment options. So to deploy a Micronode application, you can uh, Gradle W assemble a runnable uh, jar file. <coughs> um, in, and that will build like a jar file which I can run. You can also do Gradle W um, uh, Docker build, which will, be, which will build a Docker image for my application. And all of these commands have equivalents in Maven. So we have, Maven, I think it's Maven W package, uh, packaging Docker or, or whatever, and you know all of them have equivalents in Maven as well. So you can build Docker images. And the other thing you can build is native images. So you can say native compile, and this will compile the application into, into a native image. You can even run the native image locally. And the only thing you do have to do is activate test resources from the native image. And if I do this, it will compile the application, my complete application, into a native executable with Graal VM. And the other command that's useful is Gradle W native test. So you can do, or you can write JUnit 5 tests that are natively executable. And you can write native tests. And uh, you can also do Gradle W test hyphen P agent, which will activate the Graal VM tracing agent if you want to do, like, produce your own reflective data. But in most cases, you don't need to think about that, right? <laughs> you just build a native image, or you can do Gradle W Docker build native and, and build a, a Docker image from, from uh, using native image, and, and you're ready to go. Now, one thing to remember with native image is the, the image that's being produced now is specific to this machine. This happens to be a relatively long in the tooth Intel based <laughs> MacBook Pro. Um, if you, so it's going to build it in an x86 uh, image for the Mac. If you're on an ARM machine, uh, you know, the, new, the newer M2 MacBooks, whatever, they'll build an ARM based. So it's going to build an image that is specific to the machine. That's, that's also where Docker comes in useful because you, know, you can essentially build for different architectures and so forth. Um, but typically, when you build native images, you're going to do them in your CI pipeline. Right, on your in your CI CD infrastructure build, uh, which is probably going to be Linux based, and you're going to be building Linux images. You're going to be deploying them to uh, to containers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Micronaut has first class support for native image, and we have in Micronaut four we have invested huge amounts in making it writing new tests uh, and using the shared GraalVM metadata repository. Uh, which we co-developed with the Spring team to basically uh, share metadata across the, the community and the ecosystem. Um, so uh, whilst that image is building, and I'm sure it'll, it'll build and start up eventually, um, the Micronaut framework and GraalVM are leading this revolution into ahead of time compilation, AOT. Uh, Micronaut was the first framework to support GraalVM native images. Um, in the recent times, server-side Java is adapting to this new world, right? And Micronaut is really pushing boundaries uh, with regards to what is possible with modern architectures. Building more efficient applications is possible today, right now, with the right framework choices. And whilst AOT does sacrifice some compilation speed, uh, it opens up possibilities that were not technically possible before. To take Java to new workloads, particularly in serverless, containerized workloads, IoT, et cetera, et cetera, even command line applications. You know, we have a lot of people using Micronaut plus GraalVM to build really great command line experiences for Java, using Java. You know, these things were not technically possible before. It's a reality today, and it's a really exciting time to be a Java developer, so I hope you all get to try these technologies. I think they are very, very cool. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And if you have any questions after the talk, don't hesitate to ask. I'll be around. Thank you.